This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Hello. Without question, the film of this awards season is Nomadland. It won four BAFTAs the other night, including Best Film, and multiple Oscars are sure to follow. Nomadland is an inexpensive film, starring Frances McDormand as a widow living in a van, working odd jobs across America. She finds solace amongst a community of van dwellers that the story spends time with from South Dakota to Nebraska, Arizona to California. To be clear, most of the people we meet in the movie are not professional actors. They are the nomads of the title. This is the land they scatter across. I'm going to be 75 this year, and I think I've lived a pretty good life. I've seen some really neat things, kayaking, all those places. And, you know, like like moose in the wild, a moose family on a river in Idaho, and um, big white pelicans landing just six feet over my kayak on a lake in Colorado. The film is based on a non-fiction book by Jessica Bruder, but in every way, what we see on screen is absolutely typical of the verite subject matter, the melding of fact and fiction, the modest, naturalistic style of its 39-year-old director, Chloe Zhao. She was born in Beijing and spent years crisscrossing America via school in Brighton. This is Chloe's third film. Its star, Frances McDormand, had optioned Jessica Bruder's book, but it seems that Chloe was already working on a script about young people living in vans. Well, friends saw the writer at Toronto Film Festival, and I think the producer in her put the two and two together. She thought, oh, maybe there's a way to make this film differently than I thought it was going to be, and and then she called me up, and that's how, how it got started. The characters like Patty, Linda May, Swanky, you know, are these people that were in the book or are they people that you then went looking for? Oh, it's a mixture. Um, the, our cast are made of three categories. You know, one was who Jessica Buder, the author of the book, had met through her travelings. And then the other third was the people that we met in prep and while making the film. And then also we have people that in Friends Life, actors that we brought in to complete the cast. I was very lucky a couple of years ago to interview Brady Jandro. He came into the studio at the BBC. Oh. Of course, he's the star of your film, The Rider. And he, he described spending years working with you. And that's sort of very characteristic of how you work, though, isn't it? That idea of... Collaboration. It is collaboration, isn't it? You're looking for the story through character. And it is time, so much time to spend with people to do that. Yes, I think it it depends on the person. You know, some folks, it takes a long time for them to be able to trust someone to come in and want to put a camera on them. Other people like, say, Derek, who is the young drifter I met on the road, uh, two days later, we were shooting. You know, he's he's just you see someone is so open to have different life experiences. He's very, very trusting in that way, and also he's very savvy. He's been living on the road for years. Like he can tell very quickly who he can trust or not. Where are your mom and dad? Back home in Wisconsin. Think they worry about you? You don't get lonely. You got a girlfriend anywhere? Well, to be truthful, there's one. Mm -hmm. She lives up in the North Country, small farm. She's happy with her life there. I write letters to her. Oh, smart man. Very good. Letters are good. I just can't ever write about anything I reckon she'd care about. When we first see him, he looks like a 19th century gold panner, doesn't he? He has that hat. He could be out of a, a photograph from 1840 of the, of the Wild West. Yes, yes. That's how he, uh, he goes about in life. And, and uh, when he starts to, to talk, I thought he literally walked out of Wild Women poem. That's what happens on the road. You meet people who who are so authentically themselves. 
you know, I, I find that sometimes being big cities for too long, uh, the force of conformity is so strong. It's refreshing to meet people who are sort of cut off from that and who are finding their identity in a very unique and individualistic way. So when you met him, how long was it before you said, I'm actually making a film and I'd love to put you in it? Well, our really wonderful um, street casting person, Hannah Peterson, she went out there because uh, I was looking for a young woman, young tra- female travelers. And then she just went out there and she filmed a lot of young travelers in the desert. And then I heard, as soon as she he spoke, I think he said, I'm from Michigan or something. He just said the Great Lakes. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Who is that? And where is he right now? I and mean, I think he hopped the train and he went away somewhere. I had to put him on a on a bus or like we had to bring him back to Arizona. I didn't care whether he's okay with the camera or not. Like I just knew he had to be in the film. Chloe, did you do all the journey yourself? Were you there for every shot of the film? Oh yeah, we we were everyone, our whole company, including Fran, was there for almost every shot of the film. Yes. We, we traveled as a group. If we're not there, then we're left behind somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have that route sort of planned out in advance? I'm just wondering how much you just went with things or how, how organized you had to be. It's probably the most organization that, uh, that you can imagine. It's so interesting. Uh, um, I, when I made my first film, I used to think that being spontaneous and free is not to plan. <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize it's like anybody who's done road trips will know the great road trip happens when you done the proper planning yeah. and then you can truly be spontaneous. Almost everything you see, the, the bigger piece you see on screen is carefully planted based on weather, time of the year, because we were hitting almost every spot in the American West. And that's a very diverse amount of weather and landscapes. That's why we had to shoot for five months and take breaks in between. We're waiting for the weather to be, you know, habitable. It, it's like an organism that that you carefully plan out and then it starts to grow as you start shooting. It starts to take on its own kind of rules. Like so for example, when the hurricane came when we were in in the point arena, it took about 10 minutes for everyone to abandon the current scene. <laughs> everything to be ready, camera ready. We, we just arrived on that cliff and no one can hear each other on that cliff. And I was watching the whole crew working, getting those moments. It's an incredible thing to, to watch. And that's the spontaneous moments that we were able to do because we had planned. There was a particular moment in the film that I found very moving. And this is Swanky's film of the swallows come around a bend uh, was a cliff and find hundreds and hundreds of swallow nests on the on the wall of the cliff and the swallows fa- flying all around and reflecting in the water so it looks like I'm flying with the swallows and they're under me and over me and all around me and the little babies are hatching tell me first of all how you met swanky and the things that she shares are really extreme and and difficult how much time, for example, did you spend with her, putting her at her ease, finding out about her? Well, I, I met Swanky because she was featured in Jessica's book. When Swanky first showed me that video that you saw in the film and told me basically very similarly what you heard at that speech, I knew that had to be in the movie. You know, you, you, when you go out there and research, you're looking for these little clues. Like what is the soul of this film? This isn't just a plot. And when I have a moment like that, I actually build a huge part of the movie around it. So I thought, Swanky, the character, maybe how do I use this video? Maybe she had to take a trip to Alaska, right? And why would she take a trip to Alaska? Maybe she has terminal illness and this is her fin- final trip because Swanky doesn't have that in real life, by the way. And then I thought, what story can I tell of Fern in that moment to be able to make this Swanky story relevant, which is f- the first time Fern talks about her husband's death in the film. 
So it actually the screenwriting process germinated from that little seed that is so special that you have to grow outwards for that moment to matter to the audience. And therefore, to answer your question, when Swanky does do it on that moment, she's not going away too much from her own life. But Swanky is one of the the people that could take on another role, I think, to act because she definitely was playing someone with terminal illness that she doesn't have. To be fair, that she was the living interpreter in a, in a historic museum, which she pretend to be, you know, a carpenter's wife from the 18th century all day long. So she, I think, she has some like natural acting talent. It is an interesting thing, isn't it? This idea that it's just a subtle shift in which she uses her own memories, her own life, and yet it's still, it's still a performance. And there she is with one of you know, the great actresses of our time, Frances McDormand. And it's a very, it's a strange tension seeing two people like that together on screen, giving their versions of performance, isn't it? Yeah, and then it says a lot about the vulnerability and humility of Frances as well, that her she's able to, in that moment, just be a listener, mm. you know, and listening with so much intent and so much compassion and I think that helped our non-professional actors' performance. So not as much with Swanky, but overall throughout the film, she was able to help me pull those moments from the non-professional actors as well. You know, another very unusual thing about the film is that this is a movie about a woman who is not looking for love. You know, she's not looking to be saved. You know, cinema's great narrative is always redemption, isn't it? That's the way films always tend. And yet this is a woman who's not remotely interested in that. That is highly unusual. Was that something you always wanted to to do? I think that was quite important for Fran and I early on creating the character of Fern. You know, it's, 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 there's a couple of layers to that. So, uh, people compare to to Fern to John Wayne, you know, to 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 Ethan Edwards, to, to the searchers when she walk out of the house at the end. Yes. Like in Westerns, you often see the men like go into the wilderness, to the danger, and the women stay in the town or in the homestead. And this, we're, we're really, this time, the, the man is passed away. Yes. <laughs> and the woman is on her own, which you find a lot of women on the road like that. And, and they... um. Now she's the one that's going to the wilderness. Um, another on another level, there's an important message about um, solitude, the importance of solitude in, in the film. Um, when you lose all these identity that makes you feel not alone in the past, like your 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 family, your community, your jobs, when that's all gone, you have to find a new way not to be alone and instead of just having another person coming in to cure that loneliness um she had to dis- discover a relationship with herself with nature and to try to find um there's a difference between loneliness and solitude right um for, for her to be at peace in solitude i think that's a really important virtue that isn't uh, as uh, <laughs> celebrated today so that's important for friend and i and that, that final shot you referenced, that uh, the, against the landscape, was that a deliberate John Ford searches visual reference? Um, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate, but you know, it's definitely in the in the psyche of my um my cinematographer who who uh, Joshua James Richards, who grew up with Westerns, um, coming from the UK and and um he um when we when we went to Empire on the research trip. I found we found that house and then I walked into the backyard uh, myself. And then in that moment, I realized that, OK, this is the ending of the film. And then at the same time, he took a picture of me. And then we look at that picture, go, oh, that's it. You know, that's the ending of the film. Obviously, we added another shot in the edit afterwards. Um, but in that moment, it was when we knew we had to work, we have to make a film working backwards from that moment. Oh, wow. So you saw that earlier on. I see. So you were John Wayne in that shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have that picture, which is, uh, I'm going to treasure that. Oh, that I too. bet. How fantastic. You know, it did make me think that actually, I don't think an American could have made a film like this right now, as we are in history, or your other films. You know, there would be too many, I don't know, legacies of... Um, maybe guilt, colonialist history. There is a warmth to this film 
There is love in it for the beauty and potential of America and all the extraordinary people that it shelters and rejects Mm -hmm. that I just don't think an American could possibly make a Western like this. Oh, I'm sure they can. (laughs) But thank you. Um, I go out there and I, I try to connect with people. It's not that difficult, really, to to find goodness, strength, and perseverance, and sense of community, and people wanting to help each other. Especially, I think when you're out there, you are united by, say, a big storm coming your way, right? And you're not really you're in your vehicle. You you don't really have the things that societies associate you with with you as if you were living in your neighborhood in the city or anything. So suddenly you're on your own in this massive landscape with a big storm coming. That person next to you, you look look at each other, even though you might disagree on everything, you're going to help each other out. I believe that. I believe that we're born good, you know? And so once that all that stuff is shed away, that we want to help each other. And I saw that out there. That gave me a lot of faith. When I was making this film, I wasn't cynical. And it was because of the people. Chloe Zhao. And Nomadland will be available to stream later this month on Disney+, Plus, and it'll be in cinemas too in May. But in the meantime, let's revisit The Rider, which was this programme's film of the year when it came out in 2018. Set in South Dakota, it stars real-life ex-rodeo rider and member of the Sioux tribe, Brady Jandro. He plays a lightly fictionalised version of himself, trying to scrape a living as a horse whisperer after a cataclysmic accident in the rodeo ring. She's good out there for a while, and until the whistle she got real trashy and started turning there by the fence, sucking back, and I went over the front of her and uh, she stepped on my head, popped me out, and didn't knock me out until they got me back to the hospital. I had a seizure and uh, went into a coma. As I mentioned to Chloe, Brady Jandro came into the studio in September 2018. Now, this really is one of my favourite interviews ever on this programme, not only for the sheer novelty of talking to a rodeo rider as he sat so unassuming in a vast Stetson and a pair of little suede moccasins, but also for how he described the way in which Chloe Zhao worked, the way she found a story, the years spent researching and building a narrative with him. Chloe shot part of her first movie, Songs My Brothers Taught Me, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Some of the scenes from her first movie were, they took place on a ranch called the Muleshoe Angus Ranch, and it's owned by my elder cousin Todd O'Brien. That's where she met me. I was on a full ride rodeo scholarship to ride Bronx and Bulls at Oklahoma Panhandle State University, and uh, I decided to take my career in rodeo to the next level, and I bought my professional rodeo cowboy permit, and... uh, I come back to South Dakota to rodeo, and I needed a job, so I went back to Todd's. And um, when, once she seen my ability to work with wild horses was what drew her to me. And um, she would film me and stuff, and she she noticed that the camera or people around wouldn't have any effect on my connection with the animal. And so this was all before you had yes. a catastrophic accident, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. What happened then? Well, it was about a year I met Chloe before my injury. I met her in about March of 2015, and then on April Fool's Day, April 1st of 2016, um, at the Fargo PRCA Rodeo, I was uh, it was I was nearing the whistle, so I was trying to stay on for the whistle to make some money. And um, I come off kind of awkwardly, and my foot hung in the stirrup, and I swung underneath the horse, and it, uh, she stepped on my head, and uh, it was a comminuted fracture, meaning shattered. Um, there were three regions of my skull that were broken, two uh, parts of my brain that were damaged from the blood and the impact. And um, it was contaminated. There was horse manure and sand and all sorts of, you know, bone fragments in there they had to remove. And then they put a large plate over it and uh, sewed it up. And But you were, you were really close to death, weren't you? Yeah. Um, the actual injury didn't knock me out. Um, they started treating me for a neck injury and... Um, once I got to the hospital, I went into a full body convulsion seizure and uh, they induced coma. They did brain surgery. And five days later, under induction of coma, I actually woke up and proceeded to pull my IV and breathing tubes out. So they raised the induction for a little while. They, they strapped all my, my head, my legs, my arms down to the bed. <laughs> 
when I actually woke up, I didn't really know who I was, what I was, where I was, when I was, you know, I didn't really, uh, I didn't, I didn't really understand anything. Um, I couldn't talk right. Uh, my, my vision, my perception of depth was greatly affected. My left vision in my left eye was affected. Um, hearing in left ear was also affected. Um, different types of, you know, little seizures and different things and problems with memory, all sorts of things. And uh, basically, after I got out of the coma, I demanded to be re- let loose. I mean, I just felt like I was getting worse and worse day by day in there. After watching my brother Lane Scott sit in there, you know, at a hospital and get worse and worse after, you know. It's not anything the hospital's doing wrong. It's just someone who's used to living so freely, you know, being caged is just taking more of a toll than the injury itself. So what did you do? I told them I, 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 I need to be let out. And uh, they said, well, we can't legally hold you if you can pass a series of tests. So uh, I just did my best to pass them, and they let me out, and... And where did you go? Um, I went. I went for home. We stopped at a gas station. And I, I put in a pinch of chew, and after that, I could eat again. And <laughs> three days after I got home, I actually helped my father-in-law, Leroy Puyer, who is also in the film. I helped him pull a calf out of a cow. It was her first time she ever had a calf. And then two weeks after my head injury, I rode Gus again, who is a very well-trained horse. So you're saying that you had to be in your natural environment in order to in order heal. To heal. Exactly. My injury was took more of an emotional, mental emotional toll than it did a physical toll even. And being without horses, I think, amplified that to the extreme. And, you know, after I rode Gus again, you know, I cried a little bit and I was pretty happy. And, and I was like, all right, I can do this again. And uh, a short month and a half after my head injury, I actually went back to training the horses again, that the wild horses for other people that had never hardly been worked with again, just a month and a half after. And uh, through my connection, I, I believed I was safe. Tell me, how did Chloe pitch the idea to you of making a film which is a kind of fictionalised version of you? You're sort of playing yourself, but not. Well, how did she... What did she say? Before my head injury, um, she talked to me about possibly being in the film, in, in her next film. She didn't really have a story yet. We tried possibly like romance type stuff. Nothing ever really seemed to work out. And then uh, after my head injury, Chloe found out I was training horses again. And uh, she basically called me on the phone and chewed me out, you know, and uh, she was upset about it. And, you know, she's like, Brady, you could die. And I said, well, Chloe, I don't feel alive. Not riding. She said, so you think you can continue to do this? You can keep doing it and... She was like, well, what about a movie? You think you could do that, too? And I said, well, I haven't been working for a month and a half. I'm in debt. I, I'm going to have to train horses while we're doing this movie. Because it wasn't an exponential budget by any means. <laughs> so, yeah, every morning, just four and a half months after my head injury, I'd wake up at 5 a.m. and go and train horses until about noon or 1, and then I would go shower and go and shoot until from then until magic hour <laughs> every day. <laughs> Did the camera ever feel intrusive? Because it's very, you see the injury in your head, your recovery, it's very painful for you. Did you ever feel that it was just too much? When I was very young, you know, like very small, I would ride horses in the ring to be sold. And, you know, there's there's all kinds of eyes, there's cameras, there's an announcer going on, and you have to, you have to keep your connection with your animal. I, I rode my first sheep at a rodeo when I, I was only... Uh, two years old in a diaper and a t-shirt and uh, or maybe I think I was almost two you know I was always used to people calling my name and I had to stay focused on that bull or that sheep or that steer or that bucket horse or whatever it was throughout my life or else I could get killed you know there's people calling my name there's people you know hollering at me so so there's kind of an element of performance it's, to exactly what doing. It's, it's all showmanship you know, horse whispering is a big thing in film. It, it pops up, it's seen as this sort of mystical, extraordinary thing that somebody like Robert Redford is capable of doing. And I've never spoken to a real horse whisperer. There is a beautiful scene in the film where you're breaking a horse and it takes all day, so it's down to the sunset. What feeling are you projecting to the animal? Because it's really observing and listening to you. Well, you can see it. Each horse is probably as much of as an individual if not more of an individual than each human you meet you know they have feelings they have emotions 
You know, it's just like being able to connect with a person that's never had any parenting. You know, like a kid that grew up with no parents, the way he would act. You know, that's kind of how a horse that grows up that's never been worked with acts. But there's one thing I can keep in common with a horse that's never been worked with is that they look to me and they see they see something that's frightening. So I gain their attention through my connection and through my movement, my body language, the way I use my voice, how I present myself. I basically present myself to him as another horse trying to gain his trust. So... Is that why you move your head the way you do in the, uh, just in the few scenes? Just moving your head the way I move my hand. There's there's an elegance and there's a grace to it. It's not all rough. You have to be feminine yet masculine because you can't take crap from them either because they're, you know, they're big. They're a big, dangerous animal. They could kill you, you know. So when when an animal's trying to do something dangerous towards you, you, you have to be, you have to be able to line them out to a certain extent. You know, you can't just be all gentle all the time. You know, you have to be both the mother and the father. Do you think the film captures truly what it feels like to be on that reservation? Yeah. That was the biggest thing, is we wanted it to be authentic, as far as the Native American culture of it, and also the, you know, cowboy culture of it. The biggest judges are going to be the old-time cowboys, and all the old-time cowboys say we did good. So I'm pretty happy about that. And that was Brady Jandro, star of The Rider, which is available to stream and it's a perfect companion to Nomadland. These are films that make you feel like you've completely entered the landscape, the American plains, the mountains, the deserts. These are hard lives and yet still, in their way, romantic films. For the last 12 months, we've been following director Mark Jenkin as he's been working on his delayed follow-up to the mega-hit Bait. The film is Ennie's Men, and Mark sent us this dispatch last month, just as he was about to begin shooting. It's Tuesday the 2nd of March. I'm stood in one of our locations out on the West Penwith Moor, which is a derelict cottage. I've just been here with Joe Gray, uh, production designer, and Denzel Monk, the producer. We've been trying to establish where we're going to put a crane up here to shoot from. And also Joe's been here uh, clearing a lot of trees from in front of the house, and a lot of dead undergrowth. At the moment, it's a derelict house. It needs to look as if it's as if it's lived in, so uh, quite a lot of clearing to do and quite a lot of renovation to do, but it's quite it's quite spooky here at the moment, actually, because they've both gone. I've just stayed here to shoot some GVs of the dereliction, and I'm kind of miles from anywhere in a house with all the windows missing. Um, I was upstairs doing a shot a minute ago, which, and, uh, which was quite... And it was very quiet, and I heard a man and woman talking outside. So I came down to see who who was here, and there was nobody here. And I can see in every direction for at least hundreds of meters, if not further. And there was absolutely nobody here. Which it, the, the logical explanation may be that it's just people's voices travelling a real long distance over the uh, the moor. And with it being so silent here, um, I was I was able to hear it. Um, and then, yeah, just try not to think about what the other explanation is. Thankfully, whatever it actually was didn't incapacitate Mark, because we received another dispatch from him only days before principal photography was due to begin. And for those of us who don't speak the technical language of cinema, GV means general view or establishing shot. So I'm out and about again. I am actually filming today. We're still a few days ahead of when we roll the camera properly next Tuesday. It's currently Friday afternoon, Friday the 5th, which is St. Pyrrhon's Day, which uh, is the Cornish National Saints Day. So, ghoul... Perrin Lowen, which is Cornish for Happy St. Pyrrhon's Day, 
yeah, just going to shoot a couple of GVs of a certain thing. Try not to say too much because it is actually a bit of a a plot point. But there's a sequence in the film which involves the main character finding evidence of something on the island where Ennis Men is set. We're not working with a massive budget, we're not working with massive resources and it was quite a big build for the art department. But I heard word the other day that the ground had offered something up and something had emerged out of the rocks which is exactly what the art department were going to build and it's just appeared exactly how we need it which is really strange so some sort of offering from the ancient gods surely evidence of celestial approval but even when things do go well the doubts can remain especially in those cruel early hours of the morning so it's Tuesday night or actually um, very early on Wednesday morning and I can't sleep uh, I've been trying to sleep for about four hours and I've given up and come downstairs which is why I'm whispering so uh, yeah we're underway we filmed today principal photography doesn't start until the 15th but we started yesterday with a with a big set piece that we needed to get done yesterday being Tuesday the 9th so we were shooting in a in a derelict cottage out on the moor and the reason we we sh we shot so early before principal photography was that the the cottage actually has to look like it's habitable and so before the the build happened i decided to shoot a scene with the cottage in a derelict state which was going to be a, originally a few general views of the of the cottage to possibly cut into other sequences and then it it really snowballed into probably I think we've probably shot the biggest aside from the stunt work we've got we've got to do I think this is probably the biggest set piece in the film I didn't feel I was particularly match fit today my brain wasn't quite isn't quite there yet it's been a while since I've been shooting stuff and uh, the young people were incredibly patient while we got up to speed on things and also the art department I mean what May and Joe the production designers have done with such limited resources is, is just incredible um, we shot three rolls of film and they're off at the lab and we should have that back at the weekend and um, I really hope I did them justice. We'd been up there the day before doing the the setup, and um, the unit base had just been set up for today, for yesterday, and um, we managed to get the lighting truck stuck on a track on the moor, which was a really good start. Luckily, we had about three hours to to kill while we waited for the 2 p.m. production meeting to start. So we spent a couple of hours attempting to to dig it out, which was fun. A good way to to get to know everybody, and um, we actually ended up digging it out so well. We dug the front wheels out so well that the the van then dropped a bit and. Um, we actually, it actually then became grounded and the, the wheels were no longer the problem but in the end we had to get get the farmer out who just towed it out of his tractor in a matter, matter of seconds but it was a good um, two or three hours of, of team building but I think we'll do paintballing next time
and that was Mark Jenkin. We'll hear his shooting diary next week, when we'll also join Andrew and Eden Cotting as they put their finishing touches to a new animation that takes us from the ocean bed to cloud-topped mountains. With no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts and an app that lets you bank anytime, anywhere, choosing Capital One is like the easiest decision in the history of decisions. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One N.A. Member FDIC.